I am the chair of the philosophy department here at the University of Washington. I'm happy to welcome everyone to the fourth O'Hara lecture in the philosophy of physics. Let me begin by thanking a few people whose efforts and support are crucial for tonight's event. Kate Golden, our development coordinator in the Department of Philosophy, who handles all the logistics for these events. Ben Feinside, assistant professor in, here in the Department of Philosophy, who manages this series for us. And Patrick O'Hara and Katerina Randolph, whose generosity and commitment to intellectual engagement have made tonight's event possible. The University of Washington Department of Philosophy is a scholarly community with an expansive vision and an outward focus. We aspire to practice engaged philosophy, believing that our discipline has vital contributions to offer all areas of inquiry. We aim through our research and teaching to foster interdisciplinary conversations in which philosophical tools and methods are brought to bear upon problems and topics of public interest. Now this sort of engagement requires us to reach out and make all sorts of connections. We have faculty who work in the Center for Neurotechnology, the Medical School's Department of Bioethics and Humanities, the Evans School of Public Affairs, College of the Environment, the Disability Studies Program, the Center for Human Rights, and departments including Classics, Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies, Germanics, History, Political Science, and Nance. We also reach outside the walls of our campus to facilitate conversations with contempor about contemporary politics in group hubs, to bring the study of philosophy to individuals incarcerated in a state prison, and to encourage Seattle Elementary School children to find their voices at an early age by wrestling with deep questions in conversation with their peers. Tonight's event is another instance of this work. The O'Hara Lecture Series in Philosophy of Physics provides a forum for broad engagement with the remarkable achievements of contemporary science, many of which take place on this very campus. In particular, the series creates opportunities to grapple with the implications of fundamental physical theory to enhance our understanding of both the world we inhabit and the science that facilitates that understanding. I thank Patrick O'Hara and Katerina Randolph for making these lectures possible and for creating a forum that brings together people with diverse training and backgrounds, those of us in this room, through the, a shared interest in foundational science. The next lecture I will mention uh, in the series is planned for May of 2020, and we hope that many of you will be able to join us for that event as well. We're excited to welcome Professor David Wallace, who is Mellon Chair in Philosophy and History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh, as the speaker for tonight's lecture. The general structure of our evening will be as follows. Professor Wallace will present his lecture in the first hour. That will be followed by approximately 30 minutes of question and discussion. Afterwards, you are all invited to a reception in the Walker Ames room, which is right across the hall, which will run from 8.30 to 9.30. To help me introduce our speaker, I'll now turn the podium over to my colleague, Ben Feinzai, an assistant professor in our department, and himself, a philosopher of physics, to introduce our speaker. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, David Wallace. David is professor of philosophy and history and philosophy of science at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, and he holds the Mellon Chair uh, uh, in philosophy. Professor Wallace obtained a PhD in theoretical physics prior to moving to philosophy and completing his PhD in philosophy both at the University of Oxford. Prior to arriving in Pittsburgh, uh, just this fall actually, uh, uh, Professor Wallace taught uh, at Balliol College uh, at Oxford and then at the University of Southern California. Uh, he's perhaps most well known for his work on the Everett or Many Worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics 
And you can learn more about his views if you read his book, uh, The Emergent Multiverse, Quantum Theory According to the Everett Interpretation, uh, which also won the Lakatosh Prize uh, for an outstanding contribution to philosophy of science in 2013. Um, in addition to his work on the Everett interpretation, uh, he also works on a broad range of issues in the conceptual foundations of physics, uh, uh, including uh, the foundations of statistical, statistical mechanics, general relativity, uh, symmetry, and quantum field theory. Uh, and tonight we'll be hearing about actually some of his uh, very recent work uh, on the, foundation of, uh, the foundations of particle physics. Uh, as he joins, uh, as he tells us about emergence and naturalness. So please join me in welcoming David Wall. Yeah. Thank you. I think I may have got the title mixed up at some point in the process. <laughs> emergence and naturalness in no particular order. So one of the things that's striking about um, uh, what you often hear in, in public lectures on science is that one can very much find that you're presented with the fruits of science, with the amazing things that we've learned in science. And confusion and puzzlement in that process can often be in the past tense, as problems that we've overcome on our route towards the amazing discoveries that we're telling you about in the lecture in question. This isn't going to be one of those lectures. This is going to be a lecture about a profound puzzle, you might even say a crisis, in some of our most fundamental theories of contemporary physics. Physicists are extremely confused about it. I'm extremely confused about it. If I do my job right over the next hour, you're going to leave this lecture extremely confused about it. <laughs> Let me tell you what the puzzle is. So this is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, uh, probably the biggest, almost certainly the most expensive physics experiment ever built. At least as described to a variety of funding ministers in science ministries across Europe, the point of the Large Hadron Collider was to detect the Higgs boson, the particle that was theorized to be the origin of mass. And the experiment did brilliantly in as much as the Higgs boson was found in 2012 and Nobel Prizes were duly awarded. If you talk to people in particle physics, you hear a somewhat more complicated and somewhat more concerned story. Because the open secret within theoretical physics and within experimental physics was that everyone was pretty confident they were going to find the Higgs boson or something like the Higgs boson. It was a component of a very, very well confirmed theory. Uh, it was possible to imagine how it might not have turned up or something like it might not have turned up, but it was extremely plausible it was going to be found. What the particle physics community was really excited about was what came after the Higgs boson. So once in 2012 they found the Higgs boson and they found in the slightly weird units the particle physics used that the mass or mass energy of the Higgs boson was this number 125 giga electron volts. It doesn't matter what that means, either very heavy or very light depending on how you're thinking about it. Once they found that, that was great. Champagne was popped, but what was then expected was that not far above the mass of the Higgs boson, the particle accelerator at CERN would find more particles, would find new things not dreamt of in the standard model. Maybe it would confirm some of the exciting theories of supersymmetric particle physics that had been extremely trendy and still are to some extent in high energy physics. Maybe it would disconfirm those and find something else new and exciting. But in any case, this would be something unexpected, it would be the re-entry into particle physics of genuinely new experimental guides to the subject after a long desert period where that didn't seem to be happening so much. And they weren't just theorizing that on just general hopefulness. There were what seemed to be very solid arguments, arguments that get called naturalness, to think that not much above the scale of the Higgs boson, maybe not at 100 giga electron volts, but at a few hundred giga electron volts or a thousand giga electron volts, new physics had to occur. And these naturalists are going to take very seriously. You can find them in some of the internal discussions about what particle accelerators should be built and what their scales should be and their parameters should be, right through the literature. Seven years later, so far, and of course one could always 
discovered that there's something we're missing, there's some stuff that we haven't found. But it strongly appears that there is no new physics within any of the range so far explored by the Large Hadron Collider. That is, this argument called naturalness that said there should be new physics quite close to the mass of the Higgs boson seems to have led to a conclusion that has been experimentally ruled out. And a natural conclusion you get, and an entirely forgivable conclusion from your point of view because I told you nothing about what naturalness means beyond the name, is okay, so those physicists weren't as smart as, as they thought they were, these supposedly good naturalist arguments can't be good arguments, if they were good arguments they'd have led to a true conclusion, they led to a false conclusion, so okay, let's get on with physics. I want to persuade you that that's not the right way to think about it, that the naturalist arguments were compellingly good arguments, and therefore the fact that the conclusion they led to nonetheless seems to be wrong, says there is something we are missing in our understanding of these deep issues in physics. But to explain that to you, I need to take you on a, a tour of various issues in physics that starts off very far from the esoterica of high energy particle physics. I want to tell a story about how naturalness, or assumptions that play the same sort of role as naturalness, are really playing a key role in the whole of the way the subject of physics has been developed and explored over the last few hundred years, and how, in particular, they're intimately connected to the notion of emergence, of how one theory in physics relates to another theory in physics at a deeper level. And to explain that to you, I'm going to have to start a little bit abstract. I want to start by talking about, like, generally, what does a physical theory look like? I've got some system that I want to model mathematically using the methods of physics. How do I do that? What's my model like? And at a very high level of abstraction, the answer to that looks something like the following. There are three components. I start with something like, I need the actual contingent initial conditions of my system. So if, for instance, the system I want to model is the Earth and the Moon and the orbit of the Moon around the Earth, then my specific initial data is something like, well, at, you know, at New Year's Eve on the millennium, then this is where the Earth is, and this is where the Moon is, and this is how fast the Earth was going, and this is how fast the Moon is going. In addition to knowing the initial conditions, which normally in a physical theory are just sort of put in by hand or picked up from observation, there are the bits of the physical theory that are supposed to capture not just how the system actually is, but how it has to be, what's physically necessary for it. Philosophers talk about the laws of physics, physicists tend more to talk about the dynamical equations of physics, but in any case, those rules of physics that separate models that are physically allowed from models that aren't. And that in turn comes in two parts. We talk generally about the qualitative form of those laws of physics. So for instance, the, in the Earth-Moon situation, we say something like Newton's original great insight, that massive bodies attract each other, with a force that's proportional to the product of their masses, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, and acts on a line between them. But that by itself doesn't let you work out how the Earth-Moon system is going to be, because it's only the qualitative form of it. To specify the full dynamics, we also need a bunch of numbers that fill in the details. You could call those numbers the coefficients, or you might call them the parameters, or the constants of nature in the laws. So for my same example, I need to know not, only, not just that it is an inverse square law, but that the mass of the Earth is 5.99 times 10 to the power 24 kilograms, and that the mass of the Moon is a number I should have looked up before this lecture, but is about 100 of that, and that the gravitational constant, the proportionality constant, likewise has the value it has. Some of those numbers represent simple choices of units. If I, change, if I decide to measure distance in inches rather than meters or mass in pounds rather than kilograms, I get different numbers. But they don't by any means just describe units. There are objective, um, measurement independent facts about these numbers. For instance, the ratio of the mass between the Earth and the Moon. And I need to know those numbers in order to study the theory. Now, from a metaphysician's point of view, from a somewhat philosophical point of view, you naturally want to think that the odd one out here is number one, is the initial conditions of the system. Because you can think that the second and third things, those are the things that tell us about the laws, broken down perhaps into qualitative and quantitative parts, but nonetheless the laws, and it's the first piece that tells us about the contingent facts in the situation. But from the point of view of the practical physicist, in many ways the division goes a little differently, and the 
initial conditions and the constants in the theory have more in common with each other. Because those are the things that have to be measured experimentally and which can only be known to a certain precision. It's possible in studying a system to say, yes, at least at the level of accuracy that we're describing it, it is indeed governed by the inverse square law. That's our theory, that's what we're running with. But you're never going to know exactly what the mass of the Earth is, and you're never going to know exactly where the Earth is, and you're never going to know exactly what the gravitational constant is. These are all things that we have partial, often very good, but partial knowledge of. And that's going to be a key theme in what we're going to discuss. The other key theme is going to be, given a physical model of this kind, how might it relate to other physical models we use? And there's a certain temptation that philosophers of science in particular are sometimes prone to, to say, well, of course, the theory I want to be studying as a physicist, as a philosopher, is the true theory, the right theory. Why study any other theory than that? And so the laws I want to study are the true rules, the laws that really describe the universe. But of course, anyone with any practice of work, of working in physics or any other science knows, actually science is way more pluralistic than that. Even physics is way more pluralistic. Really, in physics, we have hundreds, we have thousands of dynamical models, hundreds, thousands of laws of nature, governing hundreds, thousands of systems. There are laws of physics that govern the Earth-Moon system, there are laws of physics that govern fluid dynamics, laws of physics that govern the Higgs boson, laws of physics that govern rigid bodies as they move, and so on and so on and so on. And what one learns as a physicist is a bewildering number of these different but it's very widely felt in physics that, of course, it's not just that all of these things are separate. These things are related to each other in key ways. And I'll use a concrete example to catch out how this is going to go. So consider the air in this room. There are many, many levels we can describe that at. If you're feeling enormously masochistic, you could imagine describing the air in this room all the way down to the quantum of the standard model of particle physics, or all the way further to the speculative heights of string theory. But it'll be enough for my purposes to describe it under the pretense, which isn't bad, that I can treat the air in this room as a very large number of very small hard particles moving around largely in straight lines until they undergo quite strong collisions with other uh, particles they come close to. How, how big is a large number? Kind of in the vicinity of 10 to the power 27, 10 to the power 28, those kind of size numbers. So, a number of tens of thousands of trillions of trillions of particles. Yeah. Yeah. So if one describes to that level and we put it into this kind of framework I've cashed out, we can pick up those initial conditions, those qualitative laws, those coefficients. We can say, okay, the initial condition of the system is, if, if, if let's say I've got 10 to the 27 particles, I need six times 10 to the 27 numbers. For each particle I need to say, it, how far it is from this wall, let's say, how far it is from that wall, how far it is from the floor, so, you know, three coordinates of its position. Likewise, I need three coordinates to describe how fast the particle's moving. And the equations of classical physics are second order differential equations, which means if I specify where everything is and I specify how fast, how, um, how fast it's moving, that's all the data I need to plug into the laws. And what are the laws? Well, qualitatively, they're 3 times 10 to the power of 27 couples simultaneous differential equations. And to specify the differential equations, I need, um, I need both their qualitative form and a bunch of parameters. I need to know things like what are the actual masses of the particles, and what are the numerical parameters in the laws of the government collisions, and the details of that won't matter to you. Solving 3 times 10 to the power of 27 couple differential equations is kind of demanding. So as a practical matter, we don't tend to do that. But actually, it's not just a practical matter. I mean, you'll often find in physics textbooks the idea that the reason we don't want to describe things in that detail is because of our calculational limitations or our limitations in collecting data. But I like to imagine that um, you know, space aliens arrive and say, we've come to help you out. Here is an enormous pile of DVDs that records exactly where all the particles in this room are. And if you'd like to know where they are in, in, in a minute's time, we'll give you another enormous pile of DVDs that tells us. And the reality is that there's, there's more we'd like to know about the, the way the air in the room the works than just that kind of micro-description integrated forward in time, even if we have the capacity to do it. The actual descriptions we often use for the air in the rooms are, are descriptions along the lines of saying, well, 
in this little cubic centimetre, that's what the density of the air is and what the pressure of the air is. And in this little cubic centimetre, that's the density and pressure of the air. And in fact, very often we want to find ourselves in a situation where we can further get away of assuming that the density of the air in the room is pretty constant, and the pressure of the air is pretty constant, the temperature of the air is pretty constant, and now our description of the room, instead of being 3 times 10 to the 27 couple of differential equations, is one equation like that. But ideal gas law that just says that the pressure of a gas times the volume of a gas is proportional to the temperature of the gas. And where that N, NKB is a combination of how many particles there are, initial conditions, and one of those constants of nature, the Boltzmann constant. So how does that story work? How do we actually start with this microphysical description and get out that macrophysical description? It kind of looks as if if you really knew what all the particles were doing, you ought to be able to read off the pressure and the volume and the temperature. And so insofar as a law like this is true, in some sense it ought to be true by virtue of those 3 times 10 to the 27 couple differential equations. And that's not just a theoretical issue. A lot of the time in physics we actually seem to do something that really does look like those derivations. Understanding, at least to some degree, how you go from the 3 times 10 to the 27 couple equations to the ideal gas law is the kind of thing you do in an undergraduate course in statistical mechanics. And very roughly and very qualitatively, this is the kind of way the story is told. So, start off by saying, describe the physical state of the microscopic description of the gas. So there's a classic trick in physics to do this. We, we want to say, look, I've got 3 times 10 to the power of 27 numbers to describe the positions of all the particles, um, three, 3 times 10 to the 27 numbers to describe the velocities of all the particles, 6 times 10 to the 27 in total, rather than describe things in terms of those 610, uh, 6 times 10 to the 27 separate numbers, or rather than describe this in terms of, three to, or of 10 to the power of 27 dots in space and 10 to the power of 27 little vectors of velocity, We'll have, we'll, we'll have one very big space, a state space, where every point in the space represents those 6 times 10 to the 27 numbers all at once. This is what physicists call, call a state space. In this particular context, they call a phase space. Let me draw a diagram of that. So strictly speaking, this, um, this, the, uh, the box I've drawn should be a 6 times 10 to the power 27 dimensional box. I don't have a 6 times 10 to the power 27 dimensional laptop, so I've suppressed almost all of those dimensions. But the idea is the, the x coordinate tells me the first of those 6 times 10 to the 27 numbers, the y coordinate tells me the second one, and you can imagine all of the others. <laughs> Roger Penrose has, in, he has a popular book talking about this. He, he notes that various people sometimes talk about how actually they can visualize four dimensions if they think really hard about it, or five dimensions they think really, really hard about it. And Fenner says, look, don't bother. In, in realistic physics, then you've got six times 10 to the power 27 dimensions. No one can visualize that. But nonetheless, the idea is pretty good. And now we can say, go back to that description I was suggesting where what we really want to know is not all that micro detail, but what the pressure is like in every given cubic centimeter of this room. That's a lot of numbers, but way, way fewer numbers. And likewise, what the density is like in every cubic centimeter. So we can imagine carving up this state space into cells, schematically, like this. And now each of these cells lumped together microscopic states of the system that aren't too different from one another. So there's a whole bunch of different ways of arranging the microscopic particles that all give rise to the same density and the same pressure when you average over regions of a cubic centimetre or something. And these cells, therefore, you can label by all that macro data. And so physicists call these cells macro states. And given any point in the state space, the dynamics of the theory determine a path through that state space. That's a sequence of microscopic states obeying the equations. But of course, that sequence of microscopic states determines a series of macroscopic states. The system starts here, goes here, 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 and here. And so from a micro description of how the system in fact evolves, I can get out a macro description of how the system in fact evolves. And you can theoretically imagine that that's all you had to do. You can theoretically imagine that actually every single point in this 
macro state evolves into the next macro state and into the next macro state and so on. And that would be a very straightforward way of getting out the macro description of the theory from the micro description. But that's not actually how it works. Most of the time, you, you might find you had a different trajectory like this one. It actually goes round, comes to here, and now it's picking out a different macro trajectory. And so the best you might hope is that the theory somehow constrains the range of dynamical trajectories. But in principle, actually, it doesn't tend to constrain it very much. For almost any sequence of macrostates, you can find some sequence of microstates that picks out that sequence of macrostates um, and is allowed by the microdynamics. There are really coarse-grained constraints like various conserved quantities, but those don't anything like restrict the, the macrodynamics down. I mean, famously, there's a perfectly legitimate microdynamics which starts off with the air in this room realizing a, a macrostate where it's all pretty uniformly spread out, and ends a minute or two later with all the air in this room realizing a macrostate where it's all concentrated on that side of the room and the rest of us are gasping like dying fish. So that then suggests that it's um, logically impossible to derive a macrodynamics from the microdynamics and things like this. Uh, physicists tend to treat no-go results of that kind as failures of nerve. And what actually tends, tends to happen in physics if you want to make progress is you want to say, okay, what I'll do is I'll say, if the initial macrostate is this one, I'll suppose that the microstate is equally likely to be any of the points in that macrostate. I mean, no two experts, there's like infinitely many points in that region. So what I said is not well defined, but there's a, there's a natural way of extending that idea um, to the continuum and give, having a, a, a sort of mathematically naturally given way of thinking about the prob probability that says effectively like each volume in that region is equally likely. But for a heuristic, just to keep it in your mind, just imagining that there's a discrete number of points and each is equally likely to do it for you. And then the idea is you say, okay, fine, all the trajectories are possible, but some of them are really improbable. And it might well be that actually only, a, only one set of macro trajectories is remotely probable. And now you've got, with really, really high probability, a deterministic dynamics for the macroscopic description. You might be a little bit less likely, lucky than that. It might be that a whole bunch of macro trajectories are possible. But at least you've got something that can be described as a probability rule at the level of macro trajectory. Something like, if I know initially the macro trajectory is this one, it's 50% likely to jump here, it's 50% likely to jump here. But I can know those probabilities without needing to worry about the fine details more than that. And as a calculational matter, that's more or less what one learns in a kinetic theory or statistical mechanics course in physics. Here's like the first try on that basis of how we do this microscopic physics to macroscopic physics move. We have the microscopic dynamics plus this uniform probability distribution over microscopic states, and from that we get a macroscopic dynamics, which is characterized by something like, for a given macrostate, either I know which macrostate it's going to evolve into next, or at least I know the probability to evolve into each macrostate. That's a little bit unsatisfactory. There's two problems with that uniform distribution way of doing things. So one thing that's wrong with it is it gives us a bit too much. The, what we were trying to get out for this room was we wanted to say, OK, what's the dynamics that governs how the air in the room works? But the probability distribution isn't just giving us a rule for the dynamics. It's giving us a rule for the initial states. If I really put that uniform probability distribution over the whole space of states, it doesn't just say, if the system starts in this state, then it will evolve into this state. It says things like, the system's really likely to start in this state. Now, that's not really the kind of thing a theory of macrodynamics is supposed to be giving us. But over and above that, it tends to tell us um, that states that we just actually observe systems to be in are really improbable. So, for instance, if you run through the math of this, it'll tell you that it's overwhelmingly most likely that the air in this room is uniformly spread out and at a uniform temperature. If I happen to know that over in that corner is a space heater, uh, then something seems wrong with that result. It's a, it's a perfectly legitimate starting condition for the air in this room to have some of it over there to be hotter because there's a space heater. We don't want to rule that out merely in our dynamical framework. In addition to that concern, 
the rule gives us much more than we actually need, which is to say, it turns out that we don't need anything as strong and quantitative as a uniform probability distribution. And let me show you why that is. So I'm going to consider a really simple example, um, simpler even than the air in the room case, which actually isn't that simple to be truthful. Um, so I want to imagine something like I want to toss a coin. Uh, so my, micro, my microscopic description of the coin is going to be something like uh, exactly how high is the coin at a given moment, exactly what angle is, is it at, how fast is it moving, and all I care about in this macro condition is, is it going to land heads or tails? And the macro dynamics I want to get out is the kind of macro dynamics we're used to when we flip coins, which is uh, assuming, I flip it, assuming my initial macro state is, is as it being thrown reasonably hard, then it's about 50% likely to land heads, 50% likely to land heads. If we imagine dividing the phase space, the state space of the coin up, again into our macro states, you can imagine there's going to be some macro states where that's not true. If I pick up the coin and I hold it a millimeter above the ground and let go of it, you can see that it's pretty clear that, with, that whichever side starts heads, it's going to land heads. So that's a situation where it's just, it's just flat false that the probability is 50%. If somebody proposes settling a bet by flipping a coin that way, you might want to find a different strategy. But we can reasonably hope that for other macro states, ones that correspond to flipping the coin reasonably hard, reasonably high, then it will turn out that saying like the system's in this macro state is enough to say 50% likely heads, 50% likely tails. Now that would be true on the uniform rule, provided 50% of those points are heads points, points that are going to evolve into the heads macro state, and 50% of those points are tails points. And basic symmetry arguments give us good reason to think that's true. But actually, we can say something much stronger. If I just shade in the, um, the box, and I use, I just say shade in red the regions that correspond to heads, and I leave unshaded the regions that correspond to tails, we actually find something like this. Which is to say, if you with apologies for my lack of artistic talent, that, that I've intended to draw that with about half the box shaded in red. But in addition, the shaded red regions and the unshaded red regions are mixed in among themselves extremely closely. Which has the consequence that yes, if I put a uniform probability distribution over this cell, I'll get 50% chance heads, 50% chance tails. But actually, if I put a really non-uniform distribution over the cell, I can reasonably expect likewise to get 50% um, heads, 50% tails. If I imagine, say, dividing this up into smaller cells and saying, this is my favorite cell, I'll put a uniform distribution over just that cell, I'm still going to get the 50%. Providing my distribution is reasonably smooth, reasonably simply specified, providing my distribution hasn't been delicately and cunningly designed, to sync just right with the red regions, then basically whatever it is, is going to deliver that 50% heads, 50% tails result. So I need something much, much weaker than the, um, than the uniform probability assumption to get out my macrodynamics. Call that much weaker thing naturalness. Let's say a natural probability measure in this context is a probability measure that's not ridiculously spiky. It's reasonably simple, it's reasonably smooth. Again, te technical detail, I mean, relative to the uniform measure as a starting point. It's not super spiky, I can tell you what it is without too much complexity. And we've got very strong reasons in the case of the coin, and in fact, we find this right across the physics examples we talk about, and there's a whole sort of field of analytic mechanics that, that tries to quantify these ideas. We find that for all of these systems, that kind of natural assumption seems enough to get our macrodynamics out. And so now we have a second try method of understanding the way we go from the particles in the room to the fluid description of the air in the room and similar things, which is something like starting with microdynamics, assuming that the initial condition, whatever is, is selected by some natural probability measure, like we don't care which one, then we'll get our macrodynamics. And notice that doing that, um, because I'm saying I don't care which the natural distribution is, the natural distribution could be completely localized in whichever macro state I want the system to start with. So an assumption of this kind doesn't in any way constrain the initial macro condition of the system. It just constrains the dynamics. There's actually another way we can 
get the, the, the dynamics out. Another sort of assumption you could call naturalness, which has a slightly different form and has the, has the same effect. So far, I've been assuming that the coefficients of our theory are just given and exactly known. If that's the case, then the dynamics has, the, for, for the sort of systems we want to study here, this dynamics has this very complicated structured framework where um, the regions that have one outcome, the regions that have another outcome, are so mixed among themselves that um, any, any more or less smooth distribution will manage it. But the other thing you find about these incredibly delicately mixed among themselves distributions is if you change the coefficients even very slightly, the pattern of them being mixed among themselves alters. So let's suppose you didn't have a natural probability distribution over initial states. Suppose you set it up for the coin, let's say, so my probability distribution is a weird idiosyncratic distribution, which just so happens to be exactly localized in the regions that give rise to tails. And now suppose I tweak one of the coefficients a little bit in the equations that govern the coin. Now suddenly the red and white regions mix up among themselves, and my delicately contrived initial distribution stops working. So what that tells us is actually, I don't necessarily need to put my natural probability distribution over initial conditions. I could try putting it over the, over the coefficients in the equations instead if I want. How you want to understand that probability distribution is another matter, maybe it tracks my partial knowledge of the system, maybe it's something else. But if I want to say, look, I've selected the coefficients of the system using a natural probability measure, it doesn't have to be uniform or anything close to uniform, but it has to be not, not, not incredibly delicately spiky. Then I can predict that irrespective of the initial state, of microstate of the system, it's reasonable for me to infer these macroscopic dynamics. And so that gives us our third try account of the micro and macro, which is the one I'm going to be assuming for the rest of the lecture. That the way we do it is we say, provided the initial microstate was selected by some natural probability measure, and or the coefficients of the laws were selected by some natural probability measure, then I derive, using the sort of tricks of methods of statistical physics, these macroscopic equations from the microscopic description. Okay, so that's a pattern for how we might manage things for the air in the room. And I want to talk about what that assumption is, whether it's justified, why it's justified. And how well does it generalize beyond the air in the room? And is it really true? And to do that, I want to give a kind of a thought experiment. In philosophy style, I want to imagine two possible worlds, two possible ways the world could be. Now, both of these worlds have some things in common. So the first we have in common, they also have in common with our world. In both of these worlds, there's a really large number of interestingly different physical systems. And there's a really large number of interestingly difficult dynamical laws that govern these various physical systems. And a lot of those, those give us descriptions of the same system at different levels of description, just as the molecular story of the gas gave us a description of the air in the room at a final level of description than the sort of pressure and volume and temperature description of the gas. But also in both of these situations, um, there's compatibility. Whenever I've got two descriptions of what's going on that apply to the same system at different levels, there's never a contradiction. So if the if the laws of, of, of physics that we find apply, say, to the air in, in the room, uh, say, such and such trajectory is likely to happen, the laws that describe the microscopic physics will never say such and such trajectory is, violates the laws it's forbidden. So, so far, these worlds have these things in common. But now they differ quite sharply. In the first world, which we we'll call the naturally emergent world, it's not just that the higher level theories are compatible with the low level theories, it's that we can derive the higher level theories via natural assumptions. So in each case, if I take the lower level equations, if I make a naturalness assumption about the initial state of the system and all the initial conditions, the parameters of the system, then I can derive those higher level laws. So in this kind of theory, the various laws sit in a sort of complicated tree-like pattern where higher level descriptions are derivable from lower level descriptions with the additional natural. In the unnaturally emergent world, that's not true. So in the unnaturally emergent world, while these various descriptions of these various different levels are compatible, you can't derive them. You can't apply a natural assumption to get one from the other. 
So in the first kind of world, if you like, the content of the laws of physics describing all these plurality systems is actually captured by a combination of the laws of physics describing the system at the deepest level plus the natural presumption. If you imagine coding this in a computer science style, then nearly all of the data is involved in coding the microscopic physics. Coding the requirement of naturalness doesn't take you any more bits. If you want to describe the unnaturally emergent world, you need to do a fantastic amount more work than that. Um, nearly all the information about the dynamics is coded in the delicate structures of the choice of initial conditions and parameters. Only a very small amount of it is coded in the qualitative form of the microscopic dynamics. Now, I think both of those are metaphysically possible. They're coherent ways things could be. And therefore, it's an empirical question which of those descriptions is the better fit to our world. And there are philosophers like Nancy Cartwright, physicists like George Ellis, who've taken pretty seriously the idea that the unnaturally emergent world is the better description of what our world's like. But the vast majority of people in physics are inclined to think, and I think correctly, that actually we have a ton of evidence supporting the fact that our world is much more like the naturally emergent world. And the form of that evidence is just that we have so many exemplars in physics where we actually have made these derivations, where we have started with a micro-level description of the system, applied a naturalness type assumption, and got out a macro-level description of the system. You know, a really large fraction of the whole of physics is doing that kind of thing. Whenever we successfully calculate that gold is supposed to be this colour given its molecular structure, or that such and such metal has such and such conductivity in such and such circumstances, or such and such fusion reaction will happen in such and such conditions, we're doing this kind of uh, derivation of a higher level theory from a lower level theory of our natural assumption. So I'm going to take as read that indeed in our world this, things are pretty much like the natural emergent world. And then it becomes a pretty strong question to ask why are we allowed to make the natural assumption? And one natural, so to speak, way you might think about it, is this is a kind of assumption of epistemology or scientific practice or scientific methodology. It's something like, well, it would be ridiculous to assume anything that wasn't a natural assumption. And in fact, if you, if, if you read undergraduate textbooks, the assumption can seem so obvious and easy that you don't even notice it being explicitly made. But there are some problems with that. I think that's not ultimately a satisfactory way of thinking about naturalists. And there are two reasons for that. Um, the first I'm going to skip over very briefly, uh, which is that the kind of macroscopic dynamics we get out through making naturalist assumptions tends to be irreversible in time. So for instance, the air in this room at the macro level description, if it starts being unevenly distributed, it tends to evolve towards being evenly distributed. If it starts evenly distributed, it tends to stay evenly distributed, which is to say that the dynamics is irreversible. Multiple possible starting points evolve to the same possible finishing points. That's not a property of the microscopic physics governing the system. So in bringing in the naturalist assumption, in a certain way we pick a direction of time. And the way that normally works is it really matters that the naturalist assumption is made for an initial state, not for some intermediate state. The second reason is I think it begs the question in favour of a reductionistic account for physics. Quite often, I think the evidence in physics that we live in a world for which some kind of reductionist assumption is true, that a sort of pluralist and not too stringent way is really, really good. But it's important that we have an understanding of the underlying metaphysics here that allows us to understand this as empirical data. It's perfectly coherent for the world not to have been reductionist. It's perfectly coherent to imagine that the most conspicuous way of describing what the world is like irreducibly trafficked in lots and lots of high-level concepts. Um, we don't want to build into our very scientific method that the world isn't like that. If we want to say, look, our scientific method gives us reason to think the world is, is, has some kind of reduction structure. So I think we actually, we have to understand naturalness as part of our theory, we have to understand it more as some kind of physical condition. Some kind of, some kind of principle that's maybe a bit like the laws or maybe like, a bit like some substantive claim about the initial stage of the world, something like this. How you do that isn't at all clear. I mean, one thing that happens is you tend to end up pushing the naturalist assumption deeper and deeper into your physics and earlier and earlier in time. Because generally speaking, if I've got sort of theory one um, for which I can derive theory two using a naturalist assumption, and then theory two plus a naturalist assumption I can derive theory three, it normally suffices just to make the naturalist assumption at the level of theory one. I don't need to make it again for theory two in order to get theory three. 
So if you push your natural assumption deeper, further into this sort of tree of theories, that's all you need. And likewise, if I make the um, natural assumption at a time one, and thus work out how to evolve the system forward to time two, I don't need to make the natural assumption again independently at time one. It's on the time two to evolve forward to time three. The, the original natural assumption at time one will do it. So one natural way, so to speak, that you can do this is to, is to put your um, assumption as something as just a, a basic posit about the way the world is at the most fundamental level, at the earliest level. But one can sort of speculate about ways of doing better than that. I've tried to explain more than that. And I'll, I'll just put up some phrases here to um, run the discussion. Um, we, might, we, we can imagine a situation where a naturalist assumption about the parameters moves across to the initial condition via some way in which the dynamics delivers that. So as a mundane example, the mass of the Earth is a parameter in the physics of the Earth-Moon system, but at a deeper level of the description of that system, it's an initial condition. So the distinction between the parameters of the laws and the initial conditions is something that actually mixes up among itself as you go down the levels of things. So that gives you some difference. There's the possibility that the, ra the genuine randomness of quantum mechanics, or well, there's a subtle matter how to understand that, gives you reason to think that uh, a natural distribution of initial conditions for a system might just come about because the initial conditions are determined by a quantum mechanically random process. And speculatively, in some of our deepest theories, um, or, and speculative theories, they seem to have a property you might call rigidity, a property of not needing these freely determinable coefficients. So in particular, famously in string theory, um, there doesn't seem to be any genuinely free parameter in the way we find it often true in our higher level theories. Likewise, in some speculative ideas about how the quantum theory of cosmology might work, there seem to be unique stipulations of what the initial state of the system should be. It's not something you can feed in freely. But all of this is super speculative. And I think if this was all there was to say, this would just be a, a nice situation to be in. We'd have a satisfactory understanding of how uh, emergers and inter-theoretic relations work in physics. Um, we'd have noticed that they require this naturalist glue to make it work. And then we'd have a, an interesting set of open questions and puzzles for future physics about how to think about that naturalist glue. But we wouldn't have a, a problem with it being there. And that brings us back to the Higgs boson. So we're close now to completing the circle and seeing why all of this general story about emergence and inter-theoretic relations is such an issue um, for the results of CERN. So a little bit more kind of framing to get at that. The underlying physical theories we're using to talk about particle physics are quantum field theories, quantum mechanical theories that are designed to describe continua. Fields like the electromagnetic field or continuous solid bodies like a metal bar or something like this. And in a quantum field theory, as we now understand them, although formally speaking, these things are supposed to be descriptions of genuinely continuous systems, one of the things we've learned is that to really understand them physically, you have to recognize that below a certain length scale, that continuous description starts breaking. So actually, the theory assumes that below some short distance, sometimes called a cutoff, that that continuum description either fails to be a continuous description or at least is replaced by some other continuous description that in turn can be replaced by something else later. It's going to call the cutoff. And then to specify, once you've realized the theory has a cutoff, you can start specifying it. And specifying it again as the form we saw earlier, its laws are specified by the qualitative form of those laws, which is largely a matter of the symmetries in the theory, plus a bunch of numbers, the coefficients you need to fully specify the theory. And in fact, what you find is that family is quite large, infinitely large. And it's kind of annoyingly difficult to do things with infinitely large theories. So you might worry that, say, look, how, I've got infinitely many numbers, how can I possibly know that? And then you could think, well, I'm also worried because I've imposed this cutoff, but the cutoff is where I stop understanding the physics, so this is exactly the place where the the theory seems really hard to do. Strikingly, those problems kind of cancel out. Because in a quantum field theory, what you actually realize is, well, what I really want to know about is what's going on in physics at length scales really long compared to that cutoff. So in a metal bar, for instance, the cutoff is the radius of the atom. Um, the, the system is really continuous below the width of the atom. But I really want to study the system at a level of like thousands of atoms scale or more than that. In particle physics, we don't know where the cutoffs are, but they're in super high energies. And so what we want to study is the lower energies. <coughs> and 
That suggests we do the same kind of coarse graining trick we were doing when we were talking about the microstates and the macrostates. We look for a, a redescription of the physics that only keeps track of the, of, the, of the sort of large scale features of the system we're studying. And interestingly, when we do that, we find that the theory we get at actually looks like the original theory, but just with transformed values of those constants of nature. And the transformation process whereby you say I go from my short distance description to my long distance description description is called renormalization in the physics literature. Now this might seem all completely pointless. I mean if I if I started my theory of influencing any coefficients that I didn't know and I worked out that I could approximate this at large distances with another theory involving influencing any coefficients I didn't know, it doesn't sound like I made a lot of progress. <laughs> but something quite striking happens about those, those about those coefficients. What you find is you can divide these numbers that, de that define your theory into three categories, which the physics literature calls irrelevant and marginal and relevant parameters. And nearly all the parameters, all but a finite, usually pretty small number of these irrelevant parameters. Why are they irrelevant? Well, because what you find as you start going to this larger and larger description of the system is they get smaller and smaller. And pretty quickly they get smaller enough you can ignore them. So now I've reduced my problem to a theory with a finite number of parameters, which I can measure. You say more than that. The, some of the parameters are marginal parameters, and they basically, they, they basically don't have any natural scale. They hang around at about the same size all the way through the process. They change a little bit, but they don't change dramatically. The last set of parameters are called relevant parameters, and those parameters get bigger and bigger as you scale. So as you look at the physics on larger and larger scale, you find that the relevant parameters become more and more dominant. And in fact, what you find is, it, 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 in physics, we can sort of trade off between saying things are at very short lengths and things are at very high energies. What you find is that the typical energy associated with processes associated with these relevant parameters is about the energy of the cutoff that's happening. So, if relevant parameters go away, if we're describing physics far away from this cutoff, marginal parameters just hang out if we're doing that, and relevant parameters dominate, they become huge. And crucially, though, all of this story, just like all the other stories I told you about going from microscopic physics to more macroscopic physics, relies on naturalness. I need to make a naturalness type assumption about the parameters in the original theory. I need to assume they're selected not with, the, with respect to some moderately simple, moderately smooth distribution in order to make all of this work. There are going to be incredibly delicate, carefully selected choices of the initial coefficients so that all of this story fails. But assuming we're allowed to make a naturalness assumption in the same way we make in all of our other micro to macro relations, then this kind of story goes through and it's an incredibly powerful and, and fruitful set of techniques for understanding the quantum theory of continuous systems, whether that's solid state systems in uh, sitting, sitting on a land bench or particle physics. Now here's the crucial point. The mass of the Higgs boson is one of these coefficients. And specifically, it's one of the relevant coefficients. So that tells you that the mass of the Higgs boson should be about the same, as a, which, which, which you know, in physics where E equals mc squared, the mass is like an energy. So that tells you that the, the energy of the Higgs boson should be about the same as the energy at which the theory has to be cut off and replaced by a new theory. Now, what is that energy? We don't know. But you can reverse the logic of that. You can say, OK, once I've empirically measured the mass of the Higgs boson, I now know that if I probe the theory to look for particles that are mass only a bit higher than that, I should find new stuff. The cutoff ought to be in the same vicinity as the Higgs boson mass. So given that we found the Higgs boson at 125 giga electron volts, there should be some new particles, some new stuff going on at energies of a few hundred giga electron volts, maybe a thousand giga electron volts if you're unlucky. And that's the naturalness argument that led the particle physics community to be very confident that when the LHC turned on, and once we found the Higgs boson, there'd be a cornucopia of new physics beyond it. And of course there wasn't. So this naturalness argument, which I've been trying to convey to you, is very strongly motivated in, 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 inside the general structure of how in physics we relate theories at different levels. 
is giving us the wrong answer here. Now there was another example of this too that came up. So, and, and this, is a, this is an older case. So the standard model of particle physics is a quantum field theory in which the mass of the Higgs boson is a relevant parameter. We can also do gravity, the general theory of relativity, as a quantum field theory. Again, that theory has to have a cutoff, a scale at which it fails, a scale called the Planck scale. But below that, it's heuristic and tentative that at least reasonables are trying treating that thing as a quantum field theory in these methods as well. There is a parameter in general relativity called the cosmological constant. That parameter is also relevant. So that parameter should be of the same order as the um, as the cutoff scale at which general relativity fails. Which is to say that in Planck units, in units where the cutoff happens at a scale of 1, the value of the cosmological constant should also be about 1. The measured value of the cosmological constant is not about 1. It's not about 0.1. It's about 10 to the power of minus 122. So there is a really dramatic failure of these natural assumptions in the measured value of the cosmological constant. And these, these are kind of uh, complementary problems. In the, the, the level of unnaturalness that seems to be happening in the, uh, in the case of the cosmological constant is dramatically larger than the case of the Higgs boson. On the other hand, the physics of the standard model of particle physics is vastly better understood than the uh, than the physics of um, quantum general relativity. Uh, at the level of, of high energy physics, you'd say something like uh, the physics of the standard model is under very good mathematical control. The physics of, um, quant of, of quantum general relativity is under fairly shaky mathematical control. If I translate to my mathematical physics friends, I would be saying something like the standard model is under really bad mathematical control. The, um, Quantum general relativity is appallingly bad mathematical control, so it depends on how, how relaxed you are about mathematical rigor. But in any case, we're much more confident in the physics of the standard model than we are in the physics of the, um, uh, of the cosmological constant. But even in that physics we understand quite well, there already seems to be quite a lot of fine-tuning of, 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 fine of unnaturalness. Uh, and the further that the LHC probes into energy levels without finding anything, the more sharp that so how would you react to this? Well, I tried to motivate that reacting simply by saying, let's discard naturalness, is a much, much more expensive move than it appears to be. It's not, this is not an assumption that localizes. If we start saying naturalist assumptions are, after all, not the sort of thing I'm allowed to do in physics, then the entire glue that holds together the, the pattern of, of, of connected physical theories dissolves away. And furthermore, it becomes extremely bizarre to see how it could be that if we're not justified in making natural assumptions, nonetheless, natural assumptions are so fantastically successful in letting us relate physics at different scales in all the other circumstances. Really hard to see how it could be that we have a, a systematic uh, way of understanding naturalness that makes it fail just in this situation, and yet continues to justify us using it in the myriad other situations. But how can we get around that? Well, I, I, I told you I'd like to confuse you, and I don't have a very simple answer to offer. I'll mention something that physicists discuss quite a lot. Here's, here's one observation that people have made about the uh, cosmological constant value. Um, it's pretty clear that if the cosmological constant were of order one, then it, um, the universe would be completely inimical to any form of intelligent life, any a fortiori, any form of science. In fact, unless the cosmological constant was somewhere in the vicinity of as small as it actually is, then it's really hard to see how intelligent science doing life could exist. And there are similar, though they're less compelling, arguments for the value of the Higgs boson. So, just at the level of a bare posit, here's a modification of naturalness that works. Something you call anthropic conditional naturalness, which says, instead of selecting your parameters or initial conditions just using a naturalness assumption, Select them by using a naturalist assumption and then condition on the possibility of science or possibility of intelligent life in that world. Now that as stated is a form of sort of non-reductionism. 
it's a form of saying your laws of nature require you to make direct reference to claims about life and intelligence uh, and not just the claims about the microscopic physics. And we could just take that as a brute posit. But people would like to understand and explain it, and there's basically sort of two sets of scenario that people have come up to explain this. One scenario is to say, well, if the world actually consists of, 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 of has some physical process that generates many, 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 many copies of the universe, and if that physical process randomly determines the values of the parameters in this theory, like the Higgs mass, like the cosmological constant, well, then it becomes unsurprising that anthropic conditional naturalness occurs. Because, of course, if that's the situation, you need to condition on the evidence we have to work out where in that multiverse of possibilities you are. So ju just as it's unsurprising that vast, the vast majority of the solar system does not contain oxygen, and yet the big of the moment contains oxygen, so if there was a, multi a multiverse of these various worlds um, with different values of the conditions, it's unsurprising that we find ourselves in one where the coefficients support our life, and given that we started with a natural distribution over those, then we'd expect naturalists conditional that assumption. The, the other strategy has, a, has an older lineage. Of course, it would be unsurprising to find something like an anthropic conditional naturalist holding if there was a creative who set it up that way. And that takes me more or less to the end of what I can say here. I, I, I'll, I'll pause briefly and say that I think neither of those hypotheses is going to prove on brutally positing the assumption unless you have strong antecedent reasons to think they're true. I'm inclined to think that a fairly strong antecedent reason to think there are physical processes that generate um, uh, a multiverse of different copies of, of, of our universe with different values of the parameters. I'll leave to others to discuss whether there are antecedent reasons to believe in the creation of the universe. But I do want to say that, that, that these, la these last points are super speculative. There, there may be other things we haven't thought of that explain how the naturalist assumption leads us to this badly wrong answer in particle physics and yet works so well elsewhere. But the, the real lesson I want to bring up, bring up is not particularly that this is, is, is the way to go, this is just illustrative of the kind of things people can think about. The thing I want to get across is that this is a really deep puzzle in our understanding of our contemporary physics. It's not a puzzle that you can just make go away by saying, oh, those were bad arguments. These are compelling arguments to a false conclusion. They tell us that there's something we really don't understand. And that's not there, thank you. So now we have some time for questions. I will be trying to uh, search the crowd. Uh, and uh, Ben has a microphone, so we'll try to get the microphone to people so that everyone can hear the questions. So let's found a boson by de deconstructing a molecule of uh, helium, you know, with a linear accelerator that fits your Y12, uh, the heavier boson. I just read that the other day. Do you know anything about that experiment? I, I don't. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, Okay, so, well, of course, one, one, one reason you have is skepticism about the general picture of reductionism anyway, but I, I, I think the case for that sort of general reductionism in physics outside this particle physics space is pretty damn good. Other than that, the, the best speculative thought I know is something like that you have some kind of dynamical process that drives the values of the constants close to what physicists call a critical point. So there were, there were funny features of the coefficients that, um, uh, in particular the Higgs mass, that seemed to be doing something 
uh, that surprises. They're, 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 they're quite close. Here's, here's roughly how it goes. The, um, uh, for, for, for quantum mechanical reasons, uh, the universe would be unstable in a certain way if the Higgs boson mass were a little bit larger and would be more would be solidly stable if it was a little bit smaller. And the mass of the Higgs boson seems to be just about at the right level to make the universe stable in this particular way, but on the margin of being unstable. And that's kind of suggestive. And you can, and there are there are other contexts in, in quantum field theory where dynamical processes drive a system to criticality to the book to the to the margin point. If you had some system whereby the parameters were dynamically determined and could evolve in this way, you might hope that something like that would happen. And a more general version of that is you want, to, you want to somehow look at what's special about the values of the parameters we see, such that some physical process could lead to it. So one thing that's special about them is they seem to be life conducive, but that leads you towards these kind of very speculative ideas. Um, the idea that maybe they've got the right sort of value to be, um, to, to, to be on this sort of critical boundary, it's sort of more inside a physicist's comfort zone, I'd say. But that's enormously speculative. Uh, I think, I think the, real, the real situation is we sort of don't know. Yeah, I mean, that still relies on the, that still requires the constants to be in the system as, as, as things that vary dynamically, yeah. rather, than, rather than bare parameters that are specified. Yeah. I'll come on with The moon doesn't really exist. Say that again. What if the moon doesn't really exist? It's a big joke from NASA. Um, if the moon doesn't really exist, then there is something wrong with our picture of science that uh, makes the problem I've raised here look very minor. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, so, even if you have a unnatural theory at sort of the fundamental level, it seems like you could still have naturalness appear because like if it seems to me if you start with some like probability distribution that's like really spiky, yeah. each time you go up in your sort of tree of theories, aren't you kind of like zooming out and, and blurring it out? So it seems like you know, once you go up a few levels to like the air in the room or something, that your initial, like your spiky thing would sort of be smoothed out. You might just get naturalness coming out as you, as you get more and more macroscopic. Is that, is that something that people have thought about? Like you might, maybe it's okay if the, the sort of fundamental, uh, you know, gravity or whatever is unnatural and it just kind of, it's more natural as you get bigger. So the problem with the smearing, so it's absolutely right that very spiky and weird distributions get less spiky and weird as you cross grain them. But to, to, be a, to, be a natural, to be an unnatural distribution, by definition, is to be so spiky and weird that even when you finish cross graining, it's still spiky and weird. And a, 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 another half of that is to say any old weird spiky distribution doesn't do this. The vast majority of weird spiky looking distributions give rise to the natural macrodynamics. It's just that there's a very specific subset of weird spiky distributions that give rise to weird macroscopic phenomenology. Uh, I'm wondering, to the extent that naturalness arguments uh, lead us to think that we should have seen or there should be new physics, are there additional assumptions that make it the case that uh, they think that it's actual physics that we could have observed? Like maybe what's going on is there's just some weird exotic physics, like particles that can dark matter that we just wouldn't be able to see. Could an option like that solve this problem, or is that just like a cop-out? I don't know. No, I think, I, I think that's a serious possibility. So, I mean, look, I'm, I, I'm somebody who started as a theoretician and then decided that's too practical and went into philosophy. So the, <laughs> the, actual, the actual phenomenological details of the large hadron collider are a little bit beyond me. But I do think it's, I, I give about a credence about 0.1 that the, actually it's, there, there really is new physics going on at the LHC, but it's not in bands we were expecting it to be in, and for some reason we haven't seen it yet, and the particle physics histories of the late 21st century will just pass over this whole period and, and students won't ever know it happened. They'll just go straight on to the LHC was turned on and exciting new physics was discovered. I think that's perfectly possible. However, uh, I don't think it's super likely, and 
you should, and if you take this point more seriously, uh, experimental physicists I talk to don't think it's particularly likely. They, they, they do seem to think that they, they are trapped in space. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a non-trivial possibility. Yeah, I want to talk about the idea of naturalness. Um, it's a very new idea. We never heard about naturalness before the last 10 or 20 years. In fact, the example that you talked about, the ideal guest law, can be derived, and it is derived, in textbooks based on the Newtonian mechanics of particles hitting a wall. We don't need naturalness to derive PV equals NRT. It's not in the textbooks. And I think uh, my own opinion, I have no answers, but I have an opinion that naturalness is just a failure of, an, of imagination. We don't have a good enough theory. We don't know what that theory is. And so we make guesses saying that the coefficient should be of order one. This is not, uh, this is just a failure of imagination. I mean, when Newton, when Newton came up with the inverse square law, that was not natural. There was no, uh, no probability distribution for the coefficients of the power of R. Uh, so uh, naturalness is not as important, in my opinion, as you make it seem, and, and the failure of naturalness is not a crisis, it's just a failure of imagination, and uh, somebody someday will find the right theory, I hope. Okay, so there's several things to pick up on there. So the first point is, um, you know, uh, there's a little delicacy in how you in terms here. So the term naturalness, I absolutely agree, of course, is a, a relatively recent entry into the discussion. I don't think it's quite true to say that the concept in particle physics is, is only couple decades old. I mean, Weinberg's commentary on the cosmological constants older than that, for instance. But it's certainly a fairly recent notion. One of the points I'm trying to make in the talk is that the notion of naturalness, even if it's not called that, goes back much further than that. And when you talk about deriving the iron gas law, for instance, if you look at the Stolzal Ansatz, that's in Boltzmann's derivation of Boltzmann equation back in the late 19th century, that assumption is a form of a naturalness assumption. If you don't make those kind of assumptions, then for reasons that we learned from Lo Schmidt and, and, uh, and love the like in, in 19th century statistical mechanics, we get out the consequence um, that, that, that things can go wrong. We, we have to be making some of these additional assumptions about you know, vanishing higher correlations or however you want to cash it out in order to get these higher level derivations. I mean, the, the sketch I did of how to write the ideal gas law is, uh, is, is more useful for um, general exposition of the calculation. If, it, if I was going to do it calculationally carefully, I'd have done something like a, a truncated BBTKY hierarchy, but then the truncation assumptions are the form of naturalness in that setup. As for order one issues, um, so one of the points I glossed over in talking about the, the coefficients in, um, uh, in quantum field theory is that uh, the form of naturalness assumption you need to make to, to, run, to run this look, look kind of different. So it's absolutely right, but if you want the irrelevant parameters um, uh, to flow towards zero in the in or to flow to a small number in the, in the infrared, they better be not too big in the ultraviolet. That's absolutely right. And so, uh, so that, that kind of all, call that the order one assumption. The order one assumption is a lot stronger than naturalness. The form I'm giving. If you if you drop the order one assumption, then you might find non-trivial, non-normalizable terms um, turning up in the in the effective field theory of Lagrangian. But the relevant for, for, the, for the relevant parameters, that's a lot more demanding. I can't make a rep I can't make I can make an irrelevant parameter big by choosing a really big value of the initial parameter. I can't make a relevant a relevant parameter small by choosing a really small value of the initial parameter. I need to choose an order one value of the initial parameter, but I need to choose exactly the right order one parameter. If I, if I want to get the cosmological constant at the at the level to be observe it to be as small as, as small as it is. Um, I can't just, uh, choosing it to be really small in the bare theory won't do the trick. I need to choose it to be order one in the bare theory, but it needs to be a very specific order one value. How specific has to be the value it has to have to one part in 10 to the power 120. So I think there's a, just, just can, um, it, it's, it's useful to separate out this, this sort of natural assumption from the order one assumption. It's much more stringent and, and much weirder. If, if, we, if we just saw a lap, you know, a five sixth term in the Higgs um, Lagrangian, I think we'd be a lot less worried. Um, I have a question, and I was given the mic. Thanks. Um, so I actually think that his question, like our comment, and my comment are somewhat related because I was thinking in this about a 1936 paper from Albert Einstein, and it's called Physics and Reality. And in this paper, he says the general method for the consideration of science is that we're trying to build some theory based on our natural observations. 
And so you have this base level theory um, in which you have these laws, but this doesn't really satisfy someone who's scientifically minded um, because you can't really make good estimations about what's going on in the real world. So then you start to build upon these laws further theories that are further separated from kind of your initial observations and sense experiences. And when he thinks, he says he thinks if this will lead to um, basically a culmination in all of knowledge for the human race, he says, I'm inclined to answer that this is not the solution. So I think that I agree with him that it's kind of a failure of imagination um, because there's some fundamental problem with what we're doing and there's a fundamental problem with how we've um, derived, I think, kind of the higher order uh, physical theories that we have. Because we, as you say, the, the biggest problem in this is that we don't know how intelligent life evolved. So we have this system in which all of the information about particles of an organism are encoded in some molecule, and we have no idea how that works. <laughs> um, so I, I think that understanding that is probably um, the key to deriving new physics, and maybe it's just not in the particles themselves, but in the relationship between them. So one of the issues I've learned from colleagues of mine who work on Einstein is Einstein said an awful lot about philosophy, and a lot of it is open to different interpretations. So you can absolutely re read that kind of line out of Einstein. Equally, bear in mind the, the route by which Einstein developed the general theory of relativity was absolutely not that he started with direct observations and, and, and did some kind of construction from them. He started with some very abstract theoretical ideas that seemed to pin the structure of gravity. He theorized various things that were very far from observation. And then, subsequent to that, the observations were made and it turns out. But even above that, I mean, in, in terms of some of the stuff you're saying about evolution, I mean, look, it's always possible that um, there are much more deeply wrong things about the way we're doing physics, even than, uh, than we have in mind so far. But I, I think the response one tends to get from an open-minded physicist, for any suggestion of that kind, is not, oh yes, that must be right, but also not, oh yes, that must be wrong. But it's something like, show me more, tell me, tell me more details. It's, it's relatively cheap to come up with, with, with ideas as to how things work in science. It's, it's, it tends to be the detailed development of theories that does it. And, and physics is, a, precisely because it's in, the business, it, it's in the business of having made so many extremely precise quantitative predictions over such a wide, wide space, the range of predictive options for new theories in physics is enormously constrained. So who knows where we might find things? And I think that's what we might be open-minded. But I also think it's absolutely right to push really hard on the theories we have um, in, the, in, in, in the absence of, of, of actual detailed concrete alternatives. I had another question. So uh, I'm not a physicist, and I was very interested when you were talking about, I'm always interested in how physicists make predictions. Mm. I'm not sure I totally understood the connection between cutoff and naturalness <coughs> and why why you're saying these findings contradict the naturalist assumptions. So could you explain on that a little more? What, yeah, it seemed, it seemed more like the predictions were coming from the quantum field theory or, or some calculations. How is it exactly connected to that? Okay, so, so in the quantum field theory, you want to imagine that um, there's a separation of scales. There's the, there's, there's the short distance scale at which the theory, is, which, which is the most precise description the theory is capable of giving. You try going any shorter distance than that, and the theory um, breaks down. So that's, a, that's the equivalent in quantum field theory of the microscopic description of the room in terms of the individual particles. And then there's the long distance description where we're using the quantum field theory to describe things that are going on on large length scales compared to that cutoff. So again, if you're, if you're thinking about a quantum field theory as describing, say, a solid body, then the large scale is something like scales of thousands or millions of atoms. If you're, if you're, if you're thinking that the cutoff is where our concept of space time breaks down, then the large scale physics is anything that's large compared to that cutoff. And so, the, and the large scale physics is analogous to the, the sort of fluid description of the room. So then what's going on is, if you imagine the theory initially specified in terms of the short, of, of, the, of the most precise short distance description, it's got a really large number of parameters governing it. But it turns out that if you have a naturalist assumption about how those parameters are chosen, then 
what the parameters look like in the long distance physics is extremely strongly constrained. And that's the natural of method of play, although as the person earlier, the question earlier pointed out, there's, a, there's actually a certain additional subtlety there for trying to, for why some of those terms go away. But, but some of the terms at least are predicted under this framework to be really, really big, to dominate the physics of the large scale. And the mass of the Higgs is supposed to be really, really big in that sense. The cosmological constant is supposed to be really big in that sense. Uh, and so since then we empirically observe it's not, it's not the size it should have been, then making the natural assumption is problematic. Maybe I'm putting too much weight on this because you just mentioned it in passing, but you did say the words quantum general relativity, <laughs> and those words together confuse me. Uh, could you explain what you meant by that? Sure. I mean, so, so what, what, I, what I mean by that is, in a, from, from a particle physics starting point, um, well, okay, let me back off a little bit. But, but, for, there's a line of thinking about quantum mechanics and gravity that says something like, We've got quantum theory, that's one theory, it's great in its domain. We've got gravity, that's a different theory, best, best relative general relativity, it's great in its domain. Wouldn't it be nice to have a theory that combined them, but we don't know what it is yet? That's not how people coming out of a high energy physics tradition tend to think about it. Their take would be something like, you know, you can, you, can think, you, you can use the Lagrangian of general relativity to define a quantum field theory, just as you might use other Lagrangians to do it. The problem with doing it is the quantum, um, the, uh, field theory you get out there is non normalizable In the framework of modern field theory, we interpret that as saying there's an energy scale at which it breaks down. In fact, you can read off what that energy scale is from the parameters there, and, and it, it, it turns out to be the Planck scale. So from that point of view, the search for new physics isn't to look for a combination of quantum mechanics and gravity. It's to look for an ultraviolet completion of that low energy, non normalizable quantum, um, quantum gravity theory. So the theory, theory we're talking about here is just, is, is just um, general relativity, possibly plus some matter fields, treated as a quantum field theory with frank acknowledgement that the theory will fail um, belong, um, at, at a certain length scale and it will need to be replaced by something else, maybe string theory, who knows, but, but, but some other theory. Now that theory, that's, that, that's a bit too sanguine. There are, there are lots of aspects of that theory that are under any partial theoretical control. Um, but we have we, we have we have we have control of that theory to the degree that we can do a we can do a reasonable amount of calculations in it, which is usually a, at least a starting point for understanding it. And it's from that point of view that you're the ones led to uh, try to apply natural type considerations to the cosmological constant. So in particular, that framework is rich enough to calculate um, what the quantum corrections are to the stress energy of the vacuum, and they deliver very large values of the cosmological constant, which then need to be. Uh, or they, give, sorry, they deliver very large values of a cosmological constant form term, which then needs to be cancelled out by a really carefully chosen very large value of the bare cosmological constant. So, assume naturalness, is there something we could say about uh, falsifying the second law of thermodynamics? Well, I'd always put it the other way around. I mean, if you're interested in understanding the, 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 the asymmetries in time that we generally have in mind when we talk about the second law of thermodynamics, I mean, that term is used to mean a lot of things, but one, one thing we often mean by it is the sort of de facto irreversibility that happens in sort of larger scale coarse grain descriptions where systems go to equilibrium and free energy is lost and so on. Um, so those assumptions absolutely are, are the, you know, the, the derivations that give us those things absolutely use naturalist assumptions. It's, not, it, it's compatible with the microscopic physics that um, the, uh, the systems can evolve away from equilibrium, for instance. It's compatible with the microscopic physics that I could impose a probability distribution 
according to which they evolve away from equilibrium with really high probability, with certainty if you like, um, but all of those are highly unnatural. Um, so it's definitely the case that the things I'm calling naturalist assumptions, it, it was correctly pointed out that that's a that's a neologism from my point of view, they won't call that in the original thermodynamics, physical mechanics literature. Assumptions of that kind are going on in deriving second law of time style. So yes, it's absolutely true that if you're not if you're if you're simply not entitled to assume naturalness, then your grasp of how there can be a microphysical derivation of the second law is also an error. Yeah, absolutely. That's a nice way of putting it. So let's thank our speaker and then I'd invite you all over to our reception across the hall.